Welcome to Orbital Dynamics Part 22, The Unbody Problem. In this part, I'm going to show you how I can model orbital motion with Newton's law of gravitation. I want to put Newton's gravitational equation in vector form. These forces occur in three dimensions. The examples I'm showing here are in two dimensions, and it's easy to add a third dimension, which I'll show you in a minute. If mass 2 has experienced a force caused by mass 1, then there'd be a vector in this direction. The distance between the two mass centers is this quantity r. This will be the position vector r with respect to m1. And let's call this the unit vector r. That's a vector along r that has length of 1. The unit vector r times the scalar r is the vector r. Hence, the unit vector r equals the vector r divided by the scalar r. I want to display the force vector again. The force is going counter to the unit vector r. The vector form of Newton's gravitational equation would thus be f, a vector, equals minus g m1 m2 over r squared times the unit vector r. The minus sign implies that this vector goes counter to the unit vector r. Note that f and r are in bold font and are not italicized. That's the notation for vectors. Now, because the unit vector r equals the vector r of the scalar r, I can express the force equation this way where I've substituted the vector r over the scalar r for the unit vector r, and that will simplify to this, minus g m1 m2 over r cubed times the vector r. This form of the equation comes in handy when I take derivatives. I want to take the derivative of the vector r. The unit vector will change direction, but will not change in magnitude. Hence, it doesn't make sense to take the derivative of that unit vector. You recall that the derivative of position is velocity and the derivative of velocity is acceleration. You can also say the double derivative of position is acceleration. If you're taking derivatives over time, there's a shorthand notation. This is a vector with a dot above it. This is the derivative of the position vector r. And here's the derivative of the velocity vector. And here's the double derivative of the position vector. I showed you previously that acceleration equals g times m1 over r squared. In vector form, that would look like this or this, depending on if you use the unit vector r or the vector r. The integral of the acceleration vector is equal to the integral of the derivative of the velocity vector. And this is just a simple equality. You'll recall that an integral is just an antiderivative. That's the fundamental theorem of calculus. Hence, the integral of acceleration is velocity. There's one part missing here. You'll recall that the derivative of a constant is zero. Think of a derivative as a slope. If you have a constant function, f of s, then the slope of the line will be zero. If the derivative of a constant is zero, then the integral of zero must be a constant. So to do this properly, I'd add a constant to velocity here. And I prefer to express this as constant as v sub zero. This ends up being an initial of velocity. When I set up initial conditions, not everything is at rest. Everything in the universe is already in motion. I can't start a simulation at the beginning of the universe. I need to start somewhere. So I'll define initial conditions, which includes um, an initial velocity. So this integral tells us that there must be an initial velocity. The integral of velocity is position. And as I just showed you, not just position, but position r plus an initial position r sub 0. So not only do I have to account for an initial velocity, I need an initial position, which is intuitive. And the double integral of acceleration is position. Double integral of acceleration is position plus r0. I want to set this up in a Cartesian coordinate system. I'll put a y-axis here and an x-axis here. This is the position vector for m1, and this is the position vector for m2. The vector r sub 1, 2 is simply the vector r sub 2 minus the vector r sub 1. I can derive the unit vector r by dividing the vector r by the scalar r. Here's the unit vector r1, 2, and here's the force vector f1, 2. And as I showed you before, f1, 2 equals minus g m1, m2 over r squared times the unit vector r1, 2. Since the force on m2 is equal and opposite to the force on m1, f12 equals minus f21. The unit vector r12 equals minus the unit vector r21. 
So F21 would equal minus G M1 M2 over R squared times the unit vector R21. This course is called orbital dynamics. That's because orbiting bodies are always in motion. There would normally be a function R of T that would describe the motion of these bodies. Imagine R from S1 is some function like this. This is just an arbitrary curve that I drew freehand. But it depicts a function for a position over time for R1. There'd be something similar for R2. For the n-body problem, however, it's infeasible to come up with a closed form equation, R of t. I'll show you a different way. Um, this R of t concept is hypothetical. So I want to do some vector math to compute these quantities. And these are really simple calculations. This is the vector form of the position function, and it's in three dimension. Here I've broken up the position vector into x, y, and z components. Each of them is multiplied by the unit vectors i, j, and k that correspond to x, y, and z. I can simplify this by eliminating the unit vectors and expressing the x, y, and z quantities in a one-dimensional matrix, which is also called a vector. Here it's assumed these are x, y, and z coordinates in order. By convention, x is the first, y is the second, and z is the third. I told you before that vectors have tails and heads. For this position function, the tail is at the origin of the coordinate system. It's much simpler to characterize this vector as one set of coordinates. The tail of vectors assumed to be at the origin. The head is at these coordinates. The vector r1 would be x1, y1, and z1. The vector r2 would be x2, y2, and z2. The vector r12 is r2 minus r1. And here's how you subtract two vectors. The first x component is x2 minus x1. The y component is y2 minus y1, and the z component is z2 minus z1. And this results in another vector. You can express vectors as row vectors or column vectors. In some respects, this notation is more intuitive. And this is what vector subtraction looks like geometrically. First, I rotate one of the vectors. So it's a negative r1 vector. And then I place the tail of r1 at the head of r2. That results in this vector where the origin is at the center of the coordinate system. If you want this vector's tail to start at M1, you'd have M1 coordinates to both the tail and the head of this, green, or this magenta vector. You wouldn't do that algebraically. You'd only do that if you wanted to plot the vector from R1 to R2. So notice that the length of this new vector that starts at the origin is R, and it's parallel to the line between M1 and M2. We'll need to know the length of R12. You get that by taking the square root of the x-coordinate squared plus the y-coordinate squared plus the z-coordinate squared. The gravitational equation is a function of 1 over R squared. If all you need is R squared, you can dispense with the square root. The derivative of the position function is velocity. It can be broken down into its x, y, and z, or i, j, and k components. This then can be expressed as a vector. Here's the double derivative of the position vector function, which equals the single derivative of the velocity vector function, which equals the acceleration vector function. And this is acceleration expressed as a vector. So here's how vPython deals with vectors. And the notation makes these calculations really simple. So first, I need to bring in the vPython library. And I just say from vPython, import everything. And then I define a vector with this vector statement. So in vPython, I can set up a sphere with the sphere function. And then the position is a vector. And I get a nice white sphere. And then I can access, I can reset the position function. This will center the sphere at the origin of the coordinate system. And you can see the ball moved over. So this vector function makes navigating and calculating in three dimensional space with vPython um, pretty trivial. So this is um, the R1 vector, x1, y1, z1. This is R2, x2, y2, z2. OK, now I want to introduce another mass. What I showed you before is a two-body system. 
This is a three-body system with position vectors R1, R2, and R3. Here's the distance between M1 and M2. Here's the formula for the vector R12. Here's the distance between M2 and M1, and here's the formula. These are very similar. In fact, the distances are identical. The difference is the is the direction R12 points to the right and R21 points to the left. These equations will result in a single column vector. I'm arbitrarily calling that x sub r, y sub r, and z sub r. If you want to know the distance, you take the square root of the sum of the squares of the coordinates. Here's the dis distance between m1 and m3. Here's the formula for the vector r13. Here's the distance between m3 and m1. And here's the formula for the vector r31. Here's the distance between m2 and m3. And that formula. And here's the distance between m3 and m2. And here's that formula. This is very simple math. It lets us easily compute the coordinates. VPython has built-in functions that make these calculations trivial. You can easily set up vectors as one-dimensional matrices and then can add them and subtract them without having to do all this matrix math. VPython will even give you the scalar magnitude and the unit vectors as a function. This is just what the underlying calculations look like. Okay, so I want to show you how to do these calculations in VPython. This is the difference between R1 and R2. This is the magnitude of R, and this is the unit vector R. So again, I'm invoking, or I'm bringing in the VPython library. And I'm going to define an R1 vector at 5, 0, 0 and an R2 vector at 0, 5, 0. And then R simply equals R2 minus R1. And if I want to see what's in R, oh, that's the magnitude of R. That's the unit vector R. And if I want to plot R, I can draw an arrow centered at R1 and the shaft width just makes it more visible. I'll color it black or blue, sorry. And likewise, I can define an arrow for R2. And I can plot R. I'll make that red. And as I told you, I want to start this vector at R1. And there I have the R1 and the R2 vectors, and then the red vector is R. So in vPython, the calculations are trivial. If I want to go the other way, I do R1 minus R2. And now I'd start the R vector at R2. And you can see the R vector is now pointing in the other direction. Here I'm going to show you net forces. I'm going to start by focusing on the force exerted on M1. There are two bodies that exert forces on M1, M2 and M3. Here is the force vector that M2 exerts on M1, and here's the formula for that force vector. Here's the force that M3 exerts on M1, and here's the formula for that force vector. If you want to know the net force, you simply add the two vectors, and that equates to this. Geometrically, if you add two vectors, it looks like this and you place the tail um, of one at the head of the other, and then it results in this vector. This is a simple way to determine the net force on M1. According to Newton's first law, the force exerted on M1 by M2 and M3 will cause an acceleration. The force exerted on M1 will cause it to start to move in the general, general direction of M2 and M3.
Now I want to expand this with Newton's third law. If M2 and M3 exert a force on M1, then M1 and M2 exert a force on M3, and M1 and M3 exert a force on M2. So here's the line between M2 and M3. Here's the force I showed you before. This is F21 plus F31. Here's the force that M1 exerts on M2, and here's the force that M3 exerts on M2. That results in this force. That force is the sum of F1, 2, and F3, 2. Here's the force that M1 exerts on M3, and here's the force that M2 exerts on M3. And that results in this force, which is the sum of F2, 3, and F1, 3. Here's the equation for F1 expanded out. Here's the equation for F2, and here's the equation for F3. So now I want to go back to vPython and show you how I would construct this for three bodies. And I'm running this in the uh, GlowScript website. So here's the gravitational constant, 6.674 times 10 to the minus 11. And I want to frame the, the display window with the scene command. And then I'll call my first math Earth, and I'll color it blue. The next one Venus, and the next one Mars. The make trail argument in these spheres will maintain a trail if the objects move. So that's a built-in feature of Python. All right, I will define the initial position of Earth, the initial position of Venus, and the initial position of Mars. Now, I don't use R, capital R here, because POS is a built-in function of vPython. But capital R and POS are um, synonymous. And then I'll give the Earth a radius and Venus a radius. And these are the actual radii of the planets. Earth and Venus are about the same size. Mars is like 10 times smaller. So I'm actually going to make it 10 times bigger so it displays. And then here's the mass of the Earth, and that's the actual mass in kilograms. Here's the mass of Venus. And here's the mass of Mars. Now, mass is not a built-in function for spheres. because so That's what the three look like. But if I set up these equalities like this, mass becomes a property of the Earth, Venus, and Mars sphere. OK, so the R value between Earth and Venus is simply Earth.POS minus V.POS. And then this is the force equation, Earth mass times Venus math times R hat divided by the magnitude of the R Earth Venus vector squared. And it's multiplied by negative G. So that's um, Newton's law of gravitation. And then I want to plot an arrow. Um, along that force vector. And you see I'm dividing by 1e16. E, um, if I don't do that, the arrows are so incredibly tiny, you can't see them. Here's the distance between Earth and Mars. And here's the force between Earth and Mars. And again, that's Newton's gravitational equation. And then I want to draw an arrow um, along that force line. And you can see that both those arrows are centered at Earth.pos. And then the net Earth force is simply the Venus Earth force plus the Mars Earth force. And then I want to draw that arrow as well. So you can see now I have the two red force vectors for um, Venus and Mars, and then the net force in green. OK, so that was the force imparted on the Earth. Oh, and here I'm just showing you the summation of the vectors by adding that yellow vector. And I put the tail of that vector at the tip of the um, force imparted by, um, by Venus on the Earth. All right, so that's pretty simple vPython code. And we haven't even gotten into the animation yet.
Okay, so that's the force imparted on the Earth. Now I want to do the force imparted on Venus. That's the distance between Venus and Mars and the force exerted on Venus by Mars. And then I'll draw that force arrow in red. This is the distance between Venus and Earth. And then this is Newton's gravitational equation for the force imparted on Venus by Earth. And then I'll draw another red arrow for that force. And then the net force imparted by both Mars and the Earth is just the sum of the force vectors. And I'll draw a green arrow for the net force vector. And now I want to do the same for Mars. So this is the distance between Mars and Earth. That's the gravitational equation for the force imparted on Mars by the Earth. And that's an arrow that will depict that force. Just between Mars and Venus, or the vector between Mars and Venus. The gravitational equation for the force imparted on Mars by Venus. And I'll draw that arrow. And then the net force imparted on Mars by both the Earth and Venus is the sum of those two Earth and Venus force vectors. And I'll draw that in green. So if I run this, I have three planets, three net forces, six individual forces, and the sum of the reds from any given planet equals the green. And it's in three-dimensional space. So Visual Python makes that all pretty easy. All right, here's a generalized formula for the net forces that act on each of these masses. For a given F sub i, you take the constant minus g times the sum of each of Let's see, for a given force F sub i, you take the sum where j equals 1 to n of minus g of the mass for i and the mass for j divided by the distance between i and j squared times the unit vector r j i. And you do the sum for every instance except where j equals i. You skip the j equals i case. So there was a lot of detail here. With that generalized equation, I can simplify this greatly. So I'm going to delete all that code. I'm going to create a planet list of Venus, Earth, and Mars that with Python I can iterate through. And so for every I in planet list, And every J in planet list, this is essentially recreating that summation I showed you. If I doesn't equal J, then I subtract the, I, the J position from the I position to get R. And then the force is Newton's gravitational equation, minus G times I mass times J mass times R hat divided by the length of r squared. And then I store that force. And the plus equals will take the existing force and add force to it. And I need to set up these force vectors before I use them. So initially, I'll just set them as 0. And then I want to set up the net force vectors ahead of time. 
And then in a separate loop, I'm going to go through all the planets, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And I'm going to update the, uh, the force arrows. So I'll set the position to the position of the sphere and the axis to the force. And so now with loops, I've recreated what I did before. And now the code is much, much more compact. So you recall in the last part, I talked about the superposition principle. If I take the sum of all the forces in this system, I'd add each of the individual forces. If I add these forces together geometrically, they cancel out. So geometrically, there's no net force on this three-body system. This makes intuitive sense. All the forces are due to mutual attractions between the three masses. Hence, there's no external force on this system. These forces are in interacting internally to this system. The forces will cause M1, M2, and M3 to accelerate and move relative to each other. The system as a whole may be moving at some velocity, but it will not be accelerating. If it's moving at a velocity, the velocity would be constant in both direction and magnitude, which includes being at rest relative to us. So I want to prove this algebraically. F1 equals F21 plus F31. F2 equals F12 plus F32 and F3 equals F23 plus F13. And I can expand the equation above out here. And remember that F21 equals minus F12. Newton's third law states that forces are equal and opposite. So these two terms cancel. If you add them, they, they equal zero. F21 equals minus F12. And that's those two terms here, so they cancel. And then F31 equals minus F13, and those two cancel, which means the net force is zero. So if I surround this system with a boundary that encompasses all the masses, I can think of this system as a collection of masses. I said before that we consider masses to be point masses. The same would be true for this three-body system taken as a single system. If we think of this as a point mass, we'd have to figure out where that point is. For something like a sphere with a uniform density, the center of mass is the geometric center. For a three-body system like this, the point is not necessarily the geometric center. The location of this point is something we call the center of mass. Here's our three-body system. Here's our three-body system. Here's how I would determine the geometric center of the three-body system. It's simply the sum of all the three position vectors, R1 and R2 and R3, divided by the number of vectors. This is the simple average of the three vectors. This isn't necessarily the center of mass. However, it would be if all the masses were the same. If the masses are different, then the center of mass would gravitate toward the heaviest object. The center of mass is the position vector R1 times the mass M1, plus R2 times M2 plus R3 times M3, divided by the sum of the masses. This is a mass-weighted average of the vectors R1, R2, and R3. The center of mass would be a point somewhere in here, and I'll call that point R bar since it's the average of all the position vectors. Now, if I multiply a vector times a scalar, I simply multiply each element by the scalar, hence R1, M1 equals M1X1, then M one y1 then m1 z1 and the same holds for r2 m2 and r3 m3 and if i add those vectors and then divide by the sum of masses i get this equation and again v python makes this much simpler all right so here's the equation for center of mass and i need to change the title And now I want to add a marker for the center of mass. 
and I'll do that here. It's going to be a radius of 2e6, so it's small, the color is red. And again, I want it to leave a trail if it happens to move. And then the position will be the Earth position times Earth mass, Venus position times Venus mass, Mars position times Mars mass times the sum of the masses. And that very simply creates the center of mass. And notice the force vectors are all pointing toward the center of mass, which has to be the case. Now, just hypothetically, if I want us to find the center of mass between the Earth and Venus, it's there. So I'll reset this back to a three-body system. And now I want to change the mass of Mars. I'll make it 10 times smaller. And you'll notice the center of mass now gravitates toward the Earth and Venus. I'll set that back to 24. And now the center of mass shifted. And the force vectors did as well. And this is, again, defined in three dimensions. Let's go back to the three-body system. There's a more generalized form of this equation. It can be expressed as the ratio of two summations. The numerator is the summation of each of the masses times each of the position vectors, and the denominator is the sum of each of the masses. So this is the formula for the center of mass for an n-body system. It's the mass-weighted average of all the position vectors. So going back to v Python, I can simplify this formula and gen generalize it. And I actually want to put it down here. So I want to first calculate the weighted positions and the total mass. And I'm just setting those up as um, zero variables to start with. And then for A and planet list, the weighted position is equal to the weighted position plus the A position times A mass. So every time I go through that loop, it'll add that. And then the total mass just adds A dot mass. And there should be a second S. And then when I'm done with that loop and go through all the planets, the uh, center of mass is the weighted position divided by the total mass. All right, so I need to go back and fix that misspelled a dot mass. And now I've got a more generalized equation or loop structure in vPython that will create the center of mass in three dimensions. I now want to talk about momentum. First, I'll recap some of what I've taught you so far. This is the equation that characterizes Newton's second law. It equates force with mass and acceleration. This is Newton's gravitational formula. Both these are in scalar form. These two forces are the same, so I get this equality. And I can factor out m2, and that reduces this equation for acceleration. Here's the vector form of acceleration. And I need r to be a vector, not a unit vector, so I'll use this form of the acceleration equation. The denominator is r to the third. Here I'm expressing force as a vector. I simply add a negative r hat to the scalar equation. And here's the form that uses the vector r instead of the unit vector r hat. The derivative of position r is velocity v. dr dt is v, where r and v are both vectors. And the derivative of velocity is acceleration. Here v and a are vectors. 
Here's the dot notation. And I can express position, velocity, and acceleration as vectors. Here's the generalized form of the center of mass equation. If the derivative of position is velocity, then the integral of velocity is position plus a constant, which I'll call the initial position. If the derivative of velocity is acceleration, then the integral of acceleration is velocity plus an initial velocity. And now I want to introduce momentum. I'll start with the equation for Newton's second law in vector form, f equals ma, where f and a are vectors. Since acceleration is the derivative of velocity, I can express ma this way, where dmv, where um, acceleration is uh, mv. And here I'm just taking the mass out of the derivative since mass is a constant. And this is the same equation in dot notation. Now I want to take the integral of force. That equals the integral of mass times acceleration. The mass m is a constant, so I can take that out of the integral. Hence, the integral of the force is mass times the velocity vector. And we call that momentum. You recall that if I take the integral of something, I have to add a constant. Hence, the integral for force is momentum plus an initial momentum. I showed you before that the integral of acceleration was velocity plus some initial velocity. This initial momentum P0 is V0 times the mass. Here's the dot notation. The derivative of momentum is force. And momentum equals mass times velocity, which equals mass times the derivative of position. I showed you before that all we're dealing with are the interactions between bodies in this n-body system. Then all the forces cancel out. So the net force is 0. This summation says that if you sum up all the Fij forces, they all sum to 0. Since the net force is 0, this integral becomes the integral of 0, which results in just the constant p0. So the sum of all the momentums in this constant is this constant momentum p0. That implies that since the momentum is mass times velocity, that momentum p0 is equal to the mass of the system m bar times the initial velocity. This is a very formal and mathematical way to say that the end body system is moving at a constant velocity. That makes sense since the net external force is zero. This also implies that the motions and forces within the system do not result in a change in velocity or a change in momentum. Even though there's motion within the system, there is constant momentum of the entire system. That's a mathematical way to say that for this system here, there's conservation of momentum. And I go through all this formalism because a lot of the um, orbital dynamics textbooks um, go through this. So I want you to be. Let's look at a simple case where the initial velocities and initial momentums are zero. The initial positions are not zero. If they were, that would be a silly case where everything's at the origin. With these initial conditions, all three bodies are at rest relative to us as observers. This may seem contradictory, but I'm going to draw a vector for momentum with some length. Otherwise, it would have length zero, and you wouldn't see it. Because there's a force F1 acting on M1, the momentum will gradually increase. As the momentum increases, the velocity increases. Here's the momentum vector for M2 and the momentum for M3. This is the center of mass. And here are the summation of all the forces. The net force of this three-body system is zero. And here's the sum of all the momentums. In this static case, the initial momentum is zero. Hence, the velocity is zero. That means that this three-body system won't move. And since I know the forces, I can determine the momentums. With the momentum, I can determine the velocity. And with the velocity, I can determine the position. If I can integrate all the equations that underlie these quantities, I'd have equations that would give me position at any point in time. I was able to do that for parabolic motion for the law of falling bodies. I could do that for this specific end body problem since, as you see, the masses experience straight line motion. The equations I derive, however, don't scale into more complex motions. Instead of closed form equations, we have to resort to estimations. In part 14, I talked about using Newton's method to get estimated solutions for Kepler's equation. If you model orbits as ellipses, there are no closed form equations that give you position for a given time. It's similar with this n-body system, except that we don't have to develop a lot of trigonometry in order to get a decent estimate. I start with initial conditions, and then I step through small time increments to advance the orbital motions. The time increment will be dt, which in calculus notation is kind of like delta t. As I said before, the integral of force is momentum. Momentum divided by mass is velocity. And the integral of velocity is position. 
In calculus, integrals are summations of variables over infinitesimal intervals. I can estimate the momentum by taking the sum of forces divided up into small increments over a range of time. I can also do the same with position. If I take the sum of velocities divided up into small increments over a range of time, I'll get an estimate for position. I'm going to be doing a time-based simulation, so I'll want to determine each increment of change in momentum over time. I do that by taking the current momentum and then adding the force times the time increment, dt. I'll do the same to determine position. I'd like to take the current position and then add momentum divided by mass times the time increment, dt. This is the same as adding velocity times dt to the current position. These summations are straight line approximation of continuous motions. The precision gets better as the time increment dt is reduced. And so this is what it looks like geometrically. So an object that has momentum p will move from r to r in time dt. And then it'll continue to move in a straight line from r to r double prime if no force acts upon it, if it has momentum p. But if I apply an impulsive instantaneous force f, it creates a delta momentum. And then if I add the delta p and the p vectors, And yeah, delta P equals F times dt. If I add the delta P and the P vectors, I get a new momentum vector. And so now the direction of travel is going to be along P prime. And the delta V is aligned with momentum. It's just delta P divided by M. That's the acceleration, delta V. So the force and the acceleration go in the same direction. And now the object is going to move from r to r prime with the new momentum. And then to get to the new position, I simply take r plus delta v, which is r plus p prime divided by m times dt. So very simple calculations to compute changes in momentum and changes in position. So this is how that would look like in Python. So now I want to set up a momentum vector for Earth. And I'll initially set it to zero. Momentum vector for Venus. And a momentum vector for Mars. And this is my delta T increment. And I'm going to put all this in a while loop. And initially, I just say while true, which means it's going to loop forever. And then in vPython, you have to have a rate command. So the animation increase every 100th calculations. So here, I want to reset the force vector to 0 so I can recompute it because before I showed you static forces, now these are dynamic forces and they're going to change with each time increment. So the position equals that should be plus equals the uh, I'm sorry, the position equals the previous position plus momentum divided by mass times dt and then the momentum equals the force times dt and that's plus equals. So now if I run this, the balls move together, and you can see the forces increase over time. So with a simple addition to this code, I created straight line motion. Now you notice when the planets combined, they kind of went off to infinity. So um, mathematically, if the distance between the planets are tiny, then the velocities end up exceeding the speed of light, which is not possible. So one thing I need to do is I need to check to see if the two um, spheres, if the radii have impinged on each other. So if the magnitude of R is greater than the sum of the radii, you would compute the force equations. If, if the two planets have collided, then I need to combine the positions. 
I need to combine the masses. And on that planet list, Venus, Earth, and Mars, I need to combine the momentums. And the radii. And then I want to make um, the J planet invisible because it's going to disappear and the arrow invisible. And with this command, I remove that planet from the planet list. So now as these get close together, they combine into one big mass, which is the sum of all three masses, which is the more proper way to do that. Okay, so I want to go back to a simple case. What if I had three equal masses? They would um, combine together into one. The center of mass is the uh, cyan object. Here, the center of mass is offset. And so if I run the simulation, those combine. And then everything eventually converges at the center of mass. Here I've increased the um, mass of blue and I left uh, cyan and yellow constant. And you can see the center of mass. And notice the center of mass never moves. And they combine that way. And here's um, the animation I showed you in the previous program. So they all coalesce at the center of mass. If I change the masses, now think about the law of falling bodies. Now the speeds may be different, but they all coalesce simultaneously at the center of mass if they're in straight line motion. Now I want to describe a dynamic case where the masses don't start at rest. I'm going to give them initial momentums that don't point towards the center of mass of the n-body system. For Newton's gravitational equation, the gravitational force is the constant g times the two masses and divided by the distance between them squared. This gravitational force will cause a change in momentum. This force will cause a change in this momentum. It's not just changing the magnitude, it's also changing the direction. That new momentum will change the position, which will affect the distance from M1 to M2. The change in distance from M1 to M3 will change the force, since the force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the two masses. So the change in the P1 momentum caused by F1, the F1 force, will cause a change in the F1 force because of the change in position. And the new F1 force will cause yet another change in the P1 momentum, and so on. This is dynamics. All this constant here are the masses of the bodies. And just as an aside, in Newtonian physics, mass is considered to be constant. I'll talk to you later about special relativity. Einstein theorized that the masses also change in relation to the velocities. Thus, there really are no constants in this n-body system. This may appear intimidating. Everything is changing all at once. It's actually not that bad. In fact, the calculations I showed you in vPython work for this dynamic case. This is the formula for the center of mass. We can derive momentum by taking the integral of force. Before the initial momentum was zero, so I left off the P0 term. Now I want to add it back. Position is the integral of momentum divided by mass. And R0 is the initial position. And then the sum of all the forces is zero. And then depending on how I set up the initial conditions, the three-body system may move at a constant velocity with a constant momentum. And you'll be able to see that by watching the center of mass. The net momentum will be some constant P0. And don't confuse this with P0, P1, P2, P3. This P0 is for the entire three-body system. OK, now I want to set up some initial momentums. So now you can see the center of mass is moving at a constant velocity in a straight line. 
And now these aren't collapsing into each other. And you'll notice that there are no elliptical orbits in this simulation. Now they are straight line approximations. All right, so something else I'm doing here is I'm gonna set up an initial velocity and then momentum is velocity times mass and I'm gonna do that for all three planets. So as I said, you'll notice there's no elliptical shapes in these orbits. So one of the things Newton realized was an ellipse was just one instance and one condition of two orbital bodies. And you also notice that there is no central body like the sun that things are orbiting around. All right, so here I'm updating velocity. And then here I'm, um, I've added a velocity vector. And these vectors now I need to change their position and their magnitude, which is done with the axis argument in B Python. And there's the velocity arrow. There's, I'm gonna create a Venus velocity arrow. And a Mars velocity arrow. All right, so now I'm plotting momentums and velocity. So you can see the red vectors go in the direction of motion and the green vectors are the forces. So blue and yellow just collided and they combined. And here I had the setup so that the center of mass would stay in the middle of the scene. But I actually want to show you that this is corkscrewing in three dimensions. So there's no way to get a closed form equation to model these complex motions. The only way I know to do it is with these straight line approximations. Okay, I want to change some of the parameters and show you how the dynamics change. Okay, this is a case where the masses don't combine. And you can see as the mass of bodies get closer to each other, the force vectors increase. And they're always pointing at the red center of mass. And so again, you can see there's no ellipses here. These are odd corkscrewing motions. Everything's co-orbiting, there's no central body like the sun. Now, if I go in and I change the time increment to 23, this is gonna run 10 times faster, but the dynamics change because now the straight line approximations are different. So these aren't the same motions because I'm estimating differently. Yeah, you know, look at those odd eccentric motions. And at some po point, it looks like yellow is gonna go out to infinity and cyan and blue are locked in an orbit. Okay, here is a uh, sun and a planet orbiting. And purple is now the force vector, red's the velocity vector. So that's centripetal force that Newton talked about. Here's a more elliptical orbit. And note that the force increases 
and periapsis and decreases in apoapsis, and the velocity is always straight line with the uh, direction of motion. This is also elliptical with the periapsis to the right instead of the left. And notice how small the force gets at apoapsis. And the velocity gets smaller as well. And this is the 1 over r squared relationship. And I'll show you in a later part why this results in something that approximates an ellipse. So here's two bodies with the same mass that are co-orbiting each other. So here there's no central mass. And again, you can see the forces increase. And so the velocities have to increase when the forces increase in order for these to stay apart. Here's another example where one is more massive. And you can see these, these aren't ellipses. And they're orbiting in three-dimensional space. There's another example with just different parameters. Now you can see these look nearly circular. And I'm doing all this just by setting up different positions and different velocities. There's a lot of trial and error with this. Sometimes you get things that go off to infinity, and sometimes they look pretty nice. But here's one body orbiting outside another. And again, the, the uh, force vectors, the acceleration vectors, always point toward the center of mass. And here's one that simulates a hyperbolic trajectory. And in theory, these would go off to infinity. And then these are two co-orbiting bodies where the two-body system is traveling at a constant velocity. And this as well as hyperbolic, but note the center of mass. It's always traveling at a constant velocity, even though these are hyperbolic. And that's similar. Here's three bodies. So yellow looks like it's elliptical, but just watch and see what happens. 
So again, common center of mass, these interactions are all within this three-body system. And what's interesting here is that at some point, these orbits are going to get planar. And again, you could do complex closed form equations to try to predict that. It's much, much easier in simulations like this. There's another hyperbolic trajectory. So one of the Python examples is a program called stars.py. And I modeled this code after that. Um, they wrote theirs a little bit differently. I actually leveraged their code when I wrote mine here. But now I want to set up a set of random masses. And I'll set up an empty planet list. And then it's a range of colors so that there's a diversity of color. And I'll set up 20 planets. And that's a notional mass. I'm going to vary those so they're each a little bit different. And that's a notional radius that I'll also vary. and then a notional distance, which I'll vary as well. I'll give every one of them a starting velocity, which again, I'm going to vary. OK, so I'm going to increment i from 0 to 20. And in each iteration, I'm going to create a sphere. And planet, is a, in this case, is a temporary variable. But that'll create a unique sphere. And I'll choose a color from my colors list. And you'll notice the index for planet colors is I modulo 5, which means I'll step through those colors in order 1 through 5. And then the position is the planet distance times a random vector. And then the radius is the planet radius times a random number. The mass is a mass times a random number, and these are all different random numbers. I could have equated radius with mass, but I didn't. I set the force initially to zero, and I'm going to create force arrows for all these. And then I'll give the planet an initial velocity times a random number, so they're all different. And then I'll compute the momentum, velocity times mass. And then a velocity vector. And you'll notice I hid the force vector, and I'm hiding the velocity vector as well. And then I plan planet to my planet list. And if I go through that iteration, I get all these planets. And then I don't want that statement in there. That was a mistake. And voila, they all move according to Newton's gravitational equation. And notice the red center of mass is going in a straight line. And if I run it again, I get different random numbers. So I, I get a different case. And notice there's some really eccentric, not ellipsocentric, but eccentric motions. And then these will coalesce if they collide. 
If I reduce the velocity, things run slower, but they things tend to coalesce because they run into each other. But notice the center of mass is always constant. So I bump the velocity somewhat. Things don't coalesce as much. So here I'm decreasing the masses and increasing the velocity. Now things tend to run away from each other. So you can play with these parameters and get different kinds of motions. And sometimes things coalesce quickly into one big blob, and sometimes they go to infinity rather quickly. Yeah, see, those are mostly straight line motions. So here's the stars, that PY code that comes with vPython. And this is just another instance of running it. And again, nothing here can be approximated with an ellipse. Okay, the last thing I want to do is I want to model our solar system. So I'm going to set a radius scale factor. If I use real masses and radii and distances, then the planets end up looking smaller than pixels, and the vectors end up disappearing. So I, I need some general adjustment factors so I can make adjustments. Also, if you look at the inner planets, um, you can see vectors and planets, but if you zoom out to the outer planets, the lines get small. So I'm going to add a radius scale factor, all the radii. And I don't need the center of mass anymore because I'm going to put a sun in here, so I'll get rid of that. Okay, so there is Mars, Venus, Earth with no sun. And I'm going to add a vector, yeah, scale factor for the shaft width. The Python will auto scale these, but they end up bigger than I like. All right, so now I have vectors. And now I want to add a sun. So it'll be yellow. I'm going to position it at the uh, coordinate system, 0, 0, 0, the center of the coordinate system. There's a solar radius. And I'm going to divide that by 100 because it's pretty big. There's a solar mass. Uh, no initial force on the sun. And then there's a force arrow. And velocity. So the sun is the central body, but it, it actually moves around because of the orbit motions of the, pl of the planets. So in Kepler's analysis, the sun was a fixed central body. With Newton, he realized that because of Newton's third law, that couldn't be the case. So we're going to add the sun to the planet list. And I've only got three planets. 
and now I need to change the velocities. And I used the previous Python code that I wrote for um, the formula for true anomaly to try to notionally figure out velocity vectors. If you don't get these right, you don't get anything that looks like our solar system. All right, so those are velocities. And then I need to set the position for Earth. And those were positions as of the day I made this, and velocities. There's Venus. And then if I take out that range statement, it'll auto, VPython will auto scale. And I need to make that, yeah, these 189, so they're all consistent. And I'm going to reduce that denominator so the force vectors are longer. And I'm increasing that so the velocity vectors are longer. And I'll make that 1,000. Oh, I'm sorry, 10,000. Okay, so this naturally looks like three planets orbiting the sun. So look at the sun force vector. Actually, I'll show you that in a minute. All right, I'm going to rearrange the order so they're in the order of the planets. And now I add Mercury. And I add it to my planet list. There's position, radius, mass, force. Now I have the inner planets. And in a minute I'll make Mars red, but and you can see these are orbiting in three dimensions. And they're not orbiting in a plane. And I didn't have to use any rotation matrices, no ellipses. And look at the force vector on the sun. And it varies when the planets line up. So that force, albeit small with these inner planets, is going to displace the sun. So nothing is fixed in the universe. And now you can start to see there's a difference in eccentricity. You think about the orbits as elliptical. All right, so let's make Mars red. Okay, now I'm going to add Jupiter. Jupiter is massive, albeit further out. I'm going to add Saturn. And Uranus. Oh, there's one more. Neptune. <laughs> 
and then I'll put all those in the planet list. Now, given these trajectories and the positions, none of these are going to collide. And now that I've got outer planets, I need to increase the size of the spheres and the length of the vectors. But now we've got all the planets. And now look at the force vector on the sun. Those are the inner planets. And so I'll get rid of this code that deals with colliding planets. So it's a somewhat accurate simulation of the solar system. Now, don't plan any Mars missions with this code. This is merely to illustrate that we have another way we can model the solar system. All right, so if I speed this up again, the straight line approximations are going to be longer, but you can see the outer planets moving more quickly. Look at the force vector on the sun for the most part, is following Jupiter, and it's erratic. It's not a constant force. And if I speed this up any faster now, some of the straight line approximations get a little funky for, like, Mercury. But this speeds things up. And now if you look closely, you can see the sun's force vector is fluctuating rather radically, mostly because of Jupiter and Saturn. So in the previous animation, I showed you that the other planets impart a force on the sun. This animation shows you that displacement. So if it's the inner planets, you know, there's a force that acts on the sun, even Pluto, the small planets, but not pretty negligible. If I had Neptune, much larger displacement. Uranus is pretty big. Saturn is huge. And Jupiter is huge. So the effect of Jupiter alone would cause the sun to rotate around it, the edge of its photosphere. But when you take all these planets into account, the sun is doing these corkscrews around the center of mass of the solar system. So the center of mass of the solar system is traveling at a fixed velocity, but the sun is not fixed, not even close. And there's the effect of Jupiter, and you can see the center of mass of the solar system is about at the edge of the photosphere. Saturn is also big, but it's further away. So it's a one over r squared relationship, and so it has less effect. Okay, so the key takeaways. Um, in a previous part, I showed you the formula for true anomaly using Kepler's equation, and then I had this equation that would give you um, either theta or E, and this equation for theta, and then you'd compute r this way. A lot of algebra, a lot of trigonometry, um, and to solve Kepler's equation, you have to uh, estimate. And then once you figure out the position on the ellipse, you have to use a rotation matrix to rotate um, for inclination, argument of periapsis, and right ascension of the ascending node. Newton's law of gravitation, this gives you the center of mass, which you can't get in with Kepler's formula. Um, this gives you the force imparted on any given uh, celestial object. That's the momentum um, times dt, which is its own approximation. And if you want to increment through momentum, so you just continually add f times dt. Um, the velocity is the momentum divided by mass. And then the position is the previous position plus the velocity times dt.
And so two different methods to accomplish the same thing. With the formula for true anomaly, you can only model things uh, as ellipses. With Newton's law of gravitation, um, you can model any kind of orbital motion. And ultimately, you can model um, our solar system in both ways.